All right, so now let's go ahead and look at functions. What is a function? Well, here's the definition. A function is a rule or correspondence that associates each element of a set x, called the domain, with a unique element of another set y, called the codomain. So it's always handy to think of functions in terms of this, sort of what we call a mapping diagram. So I've got a collection. So this blob here is my set of objects, which is my domain. So this was x. This is our domain set for our function. And then we have our codomain set for our function. And the function consists of these two things and a rule that associates elements from the domain with elements in the codomain. And there's a name that we will give to our functions. So in this case, I'll call this particular generic example f. So there's my name for my function. The arrow is an indication that there's this rule. And the rule happens between this set x and the set y, our domain and our codomain. And just to recap a bit about notation, if we had some element in our domain, and the function takes it to an element in our codomain, let's say b, then the notation we'd use to represent that is our element b in our codomain can be written as f of a. So our function applied to the input value a. So let's just indicate this is our input, our value coming from our domain. This is our function name. And so this together, f bracket a, closing bracket, represents the element in the codomain for which b a gets mapped to under the function. So what we call the output. So here we've just written the output as b. So there's our function notation. Input into the function, what comes out is the output. So we typically name the rule with a letter. So with a symbol, in this case, it, most generally we're going to use letters. So with a letter like F or G. In fact, any letter you want is fine, or any letter you want. Or a name agreed upon by convention. So like sign or log or square root. So we're free to use any name we want for a function. If you've created a function yourself, you can use whatever name you want. Typically, you'd use something where it uh, sort of gives an indication of what the function represents. So if you created a volume function, you'd probably use v for the function. Or if you've created an acceleration function, you'd probably use the letter a for the function. But we would typically use whatever letter we want. F and G are pretty popular. F because it's the first letter of the word function. G because it's next to it in the alphabet. Also H is commonly used because it's next to G in the alphabet. Um, or we'd use a name agreed upon by convention. So just to quickly summarize, for a function we need four things. We need a domain, a codomain, we need the, the rule, and we need a name given to it. You may have heard this term range thrown about. You may have used it in the past. So what is the range? Well, the range of a function, if we look back at our mapping diagram here, the range is a subset of the codomain which consists of all the outputs of the functions, all the things that actually come out of the function. The codomain may have things in it that don't actually come about as the output of some input. So the range is the set of all outputs. Again, we can nicely think of this in terms of our mapping diagram. So we've got our function is given by our domain, our codomain, our rule, and our name. And it may happen that the whole domain gets sent to some proper subset of our codomain. This is called the range of f. 
It's the set of all outputs of our function. Okay, it may not contain the whole codomain. So our range could be smaller than our codomain. As an example, let's consider the function f of x equals x squared. The domain is r, and our codomain is r. What's our range in this case? Well, our range is a set of all things that come out of this, which is just going to be positive real numbers. So it's a set of all y and r such that y is greater than or equal to zero. So it's not the codomain, it's a smaller subset of it. Okay, so that's what the range is, the set of all things that are actually outputs of the function. Let's have a look at another example, just to solidify these ideas of domain, codomain, and range in the context of a non-numerical example. So here we've got our function, domain, codomain, and again, remember I said four things to find a function. You've got a domain, you've got a codomain, you've got a rule, and you've got your name that you've given the function. The rule in this picture here is given by these arrows. So this is our rule. So what's our domain? Well, our domain, the things we can put into it, so Tom, Henrietta, and Emily. What's our codomain? Our codomain from the diagram is all these potential things that could come out of it. What is our range? Well, they are all the actual things that do come out of the function. And so based on where our arrows are pointing, we see that it's 17 and 20 is our range. Okay, so in calculus, our functions are always going to have a domain, which is a subset of real numbers and our codomain, which again is a subset of the real number. So we're always looking at functions from real numbers to real numbers. How can we describe these functions? Well, there's really four ways you can describe a function from the real numbers to the real numbers. You can describe it verbally, something like the area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. So here we've defined a function, the area function, where the input is the radius and the output is the area corresponding to that radius. We could define a function algebraically, so by a formula. Here we're defining our function capital A. Here's our input. There's our function name. And what's over here is our output, which is also indicating our rule for our function. So there's our algebraic formula representing our function. We could also represent a function numerically. We can represent it by a table of values. Here we've got our inputs along the top row and our corresponding outputs along the bottom row. So we would read this as at time 0 0.6, the function value, which is the velocity, is given by 0 0.8. And 1.0, the function value of that is 0 0.6. We could also encode the same information by a set of ordered pairs. You can see for these ordered pairs, for example, there's an input value, and there's the corresponding output value of our function. We could also describe a function visually by a graph. So here's a graph. This is essentially the same data that I presented in the table above, but drawn in graphical form where the dots represent those data points. And then I've just indicated that there's probably some more values that weren't given in the table, and so I've connected them up by these red lines. So here's a graph representing a function. The inputs are read along the horizontal axes, and the outputs are along the vertical axes. So this is our codomain, is along our vertical axes. What's our domain? Well, in this case, we'd have to look at the graph carefully and see, well, it doesn't look like it's defined for these negative input values. It doesn't look like it's defined for a value beyond this last point. So the graph seems to suggest that just these values here are what we can plug into it. So those values make up our domain. When we plug those values in, what values possibly come out? Well, it only looks like values along our vertical axes, so the values in our codomain that actually come out are these values here, so that's our range. 
Now we've got these four different ways to define a function. What we're going to find is that we're going to have to be able to go between these different representations. We may be given a, a verbal description of a function and we need to come up with a, a formula, an algebraic description. We may be given a table of values which represent the values of some function and we want to use that table of values to then construct some sort of formula. So we want to go from the numerical to the algebraic representation. Or we may be given an algebraic description of the function and we want to go to a visual representation, so we want to graph it. So we're going to want to be able to go between all of these different four representations of a function. Let's look at an example. So here we've got the function f. When the input is x, the output is x squared, so we can see our rule there. What we normally do in the absence of any indicated domain, we assume the domain is as big as possible, so the domain is r, and the codomain is as big as possible. So our function is taking real numbers in, giving real numbers out, and there's the rule. Let's find the following values. Now this is just meant not to be a difficult example, it's just meant to be one to, again, go over function notation and make sure we're familiar with it. So what does this represent? F two. This means you take two, you plug it into your function, and figure out what comes out. There's our general template for what our function does. It takes x in, sends the square of it out. So if it takes two in, it sends two square out, or four. What's f of negative one? Well, that would be negative one squared, which is one. What's f of zero? Well, that would be zero squared, which is zero. And what's f of two thirds? Well, that would be two thirds squared, which is four ninths. What about f of square root of two? Well, that would be the square root of two all squared. And so that would be just two. How about f of pi? Well, that would be pi squared. And there we go, it's just pi squared. That's the answer. What's f of a plus h? Well, that would be a plus h all squared. And that just means we take a plus h, we multiply it to itself. And what does that result in? Well, we would expand it out, so it's a times a is a squared. And then we get a couple of these cross terms, which is a times h, and then h times a. So that's 2ah. And then we get this h times h, which is h squared. So there's our result. Now we're going to sketch the graph of our function. So we're going to go from that algebraic description to a visual representation. So how do we sketch the graph of f of x equals x squared? Well, we had some values computed above. We knew that if we plug 0 in, we get 0 out. If we plug 1 in, we should get 1 squared out, so that would be 1 out. If we plug negative 1 in, we get 1 out, and so on. So it would be beneficial for you to know the graphs of all of these basic functions, so you don't have to use a table of values or values to get a hold of what the graph looks like, but I'm just going to show you that if we use some values, if we use enough values, we can see, okay, remember the graph of this is going to be a parabola, I've plotted some points, so it's got to connect all these things up, and so there we go, there's the graph of our function. It's our parabola, good old friend the parabola, vertex at zero, zero, and opening up.